every expectant mother knows that what she eats impacts her baby. And now research shows that is also true for our cows. Maternal consumption of Reassure during late gestation had a positive effect on the in utero calf, setting her up for better health and potentially even higher milk production once she joins the milking string. Learn more at balchemanh.com slash launch and launch your herd for life. Good morning, everyone. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing for Balchem, and I'll, you, I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the seventh installment of Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series. Today's Real Science webinar is titled Insulin Resistance in Transition Dairy Cows, Friend or Foe, with Dr. Rick Grummer from the University of Wisconsin. Dr. Grummer is Professor Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin and is currently working and broadcasting from his cabin in northern Wisconsin. Dr. Grummer received his bachelor's degree in dairy science from the University of Wisconsin and earned his master's and doctoral degrees in dairy science from the University of Illinois. He spent 26 years teaching and conducting research as a faculty member at the University of Wisconsin Department of Dairy Science. Dr. Grummer's research focused on lipid metabolism of dairy cattle. He investigated hepatic lipid metabolism, particularly as it relates to the etiology of lipid-related metabolic disorders such as fatty liver and ketosis. He also studied the effects of supplemental fat on lactation and reproductive performance. Dr. Grummer, the floor is now yours. Okay, thank you, Scott. I appreciate everybody joining me this morning. Uh, I thought I would start out by talking uh, about how this, this presentation evolved. It was several years ago that I was invited to speak at the breakfast meeting at the Cornell Nutrition Conference. And I asked the person who was inviting me, what would you like me to speak on? And surprisingly, the individual said, anything you want. And that's not very, very typical for me usually when I get invited to do a presentation, I've got an assigned topic that they'd like addressed. So that gave me a lot of liberty uh, of what I wanted to, to present. So what I decided to do, like the grumpy old man that I am, is to pick something that was a little bit uh, irritating to me. <laughs> and what was irritating to me at that time was what I was referring to as NIFA bashing. Now, most of you probably know that NEFA is an acronym for non-esterified fatty acids. And basically what those are is that's what's released from the animal's fat stores during the transition period. And there was a general census forming that, that these NEFAs are, are, are bad characters. Um, and I, I wanted to set the story straight and, and kind of clear the air, at least from my vantage point, and that's, that's how this topic evolved. The insulin resistance is at friend or foe. You could almost call this body fat mobilization friend or foe. Starting out, a uh, little, little introductory comment about body fat mobilization. Uh, very complex topic. It's, it's well beyond the scope of our presentation this morning. Uh, but one of the things that are, is innately involved in this are, are many hormones, but probably one of the most more important hormones involved in regulation of body, body fat mobilization is insulin. And insulin is a, a hormone that I think most of us are familiar with. Uh, again, very multifaceted in all the things that it can do. It basically uh, promotes glucose entry into our cells. It regulates glucose uh, dynamics in the liver by inhibiting gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, or the mobilization of, of carbohydrate stores. A major target is the animal's fat tissue or adipose tissue. And there it acts to enhance fatty acid synthesis, synthesis of triglycerides, the uptake of fat or triglyceride from the bloodstream. And the last one on this screen, which we will be focusing on today is insulin acts to inhibit lipolysis. 
so you may you may hear me discuss the term anti-lipolytic hormone during the presentation because it tends to retard or suppress lipolysis. This diagram shows conceptually what's occurring during insulin resistance. So if you take a look, we have a, an x-axis that gives us the hormone concentration, let's say circulating in blood, or if you're working with tissue in vitro or in the laboratory, what, what you may have in the culture media. So you have an increasing amount as you go from left to right on the x-axis. And then the y-axis is the biological response. And that biological response can be any of those actions of insulin we just talked about. Could be inhibition of lipolysis, for example. So as we increase the hormone concentration, typically what happens is you'll get an increase in response, hitting a maximum of 100%. 100%. So insulin resistance comes in, in two varieties. One is a decreased sensitivity. And what that means is that you can still get your maximal response, but it simply takes more hormone to get that maximal response. That's showed by the large dotted line here. You could also have what's called decreased responsiveness. But basically what decreased responsiveness means is again, as you increase your hormone concentration, you get a greater response, but you can't get to 100%. You may get to some subset of that. And lastly, you could get both a decreased sensitivity or a decreased responsiveness. And that's shown in this finely dotted line right here. Now that all gets a little bit complicated, so perhaps a, a more simplified term that really applies to the situation we're talking about today is that there's simply that normal concentrations of insulin produce less than, less than a normal biological response. So how does this all pertain to, to transition cows? Well, insulin resistance is, is really observed in, in all mammals during late pregnancy and, and during early lactation. It's a physiological process that, that cows or other mammals go through. And what happens here are several things. Some of the, the major things shown on this slide, one is that insulin causes muscle to take up less glucose from the bloodstream. It also does that in adipose tissue. And also in adipose tissue, it decreases fat synthesis and it increases lipolysis. Remember, insulin was an anti-lipolytic hormone. So because if it's becoming more resistant to insulin, it, it acts to increase lipolysis or fat mobilization, the release of, of these NEFAs or fatty acids into the blood. And the reason, the reason that the, the mammal or the mother is doing this is it's trying to make more glucose available to the fetus and to the mammary gland, which happen to be tissues that are insulin independent. That means that they don't respond to insulin. So we have all these insulin responsive tissues basically causing an increase of glucose and fat in the blood and making it available to the fetus and the mammary gland for lactation. Now, a few other comments here. Uh, many times people talk about, well, the cow's insulin resistant. Well, it's not, a, it's not an all, all off or all on situation. There's various shades of gray, gray that go on here. Now, again, I think it's important to remember that the cow purposely undergoes insulin resistance as a way of supporting the fetus and the initiation of milk production to support that, that newborn calf. It's an example of what we call homeoresis, where that is the orchestrated or control or coordinated control of metabolism to support a physiological state. So this is, this is orchestrated, it's controlled, and the physiological state it's supporting is first pregnancy, then initiation of lactation. And once again, it's, it's normal for, for all mammals. On this slide and the next slide, I've got an example of some extreme examples. One is the grizzly bear. 
I'm in Northern Wisconsin. We don't have grizzly bears here, but we have black bears and they undergo the same process. And that is in, in late fall or early winter, they go through hibernation. They basically go into their dens and, and if you will, they go into really sort of a deep sleep. Well, during this time, they actually go through parturition. They, they have their pups. It may be one, it may be two, and in rare circumstances, it may be three. And while they're in this hibernation, the pups will consume milk from the mother and go from a, a, a birth weight of about a pound up to 10 to 20 pounds at the end of hibernation in early spring. During this time, the sow does not go out and eat. So what's happening here is she is mobilizing her reserves, not only to support herself, but to support her cubs. And in the springtime, she comes out of her den and she awakens. And that's where the term is, hungry as a bear comes from. Another example is the hooded fur seal. This is a, a mammal that has a four day lactation period, more or less, very short. During this period of time, the seal does not consume food, but during those four days, the pups will gain about seven kilograms a day or about 15 pounds a day, which basically is blubber fat. And really what this represents is a direct transfer of the mother's fat, the cow's fat, to the pup by milk, which is an amazingly uh, a milk that contains 61% fat. So we have examples of this. And of course, our, our modern dairy cow, I think, is another perhaps extreme example of, of insulin resistance. So this graph shows the NEFA concentration on the y-axis from about three weeks prior to calving to about three weeks after calving. And, and the animal will go through a surge in NEFA around the calving time. It, it starts increasing NEFA concentration shortly before calving as that cow starts to prepare for calving and she goes off feed slightly. Then there's a hormonal response at calving time that really, really causes a, a rapid release of NEFA into the bloodstream. It's fairly short lived. And then during the first several weeks after calving, NEFAs remain elevated compared to where they were during the dry period because she's mobilizing body fat. She can't eat enough to support lactation. So we have insulin resistance going on and lipolysis is going on. And, and sure enough, she mobilizes fat. So our NEFA concentration in blood is really a, a proxy of, of body fat mobilization. This graph shows the uptake of NEFA by the liver during the transition period. So in, in addition to this release of NEFA into the blood, we have an increase in blood flow to the liver. And consequently, at the time of calving, the liver sees about a, a 10 to 15 fold increase in uptake of NEFA into the liver right around that time of calving. It stays elevated post calving and diminishes as she comes into more of a positive energy balance and her feed intake increases. So is, is insulin resistance a, a friend or a foe? So we're really asking a question is, can cows become too insulin resistant? In other words, the question becomes is, can they become too insulin resistant and have just simply too much fat mobilization to be healthy for the cow? Conversely, one could ask, well, gee, can you really have too much glucose and fatty acid be made available to the mammary gland or the udder to support lactation. So you see, it, it's kind of controversial. It's, it's not straightforward. At the time I created this talk several years ago, there was a big question being asked, can we overfeed feed dry cows? Can they basically become diabetic-like? And in doing so, do they become really have a greater increased insulin resistance, meaning do they have too much fatty acid mobilization? So does too much insulin resistance equal too much NEFA in blood? 
to the point where it almost becomes toxic and detrimental to the animal and can lead to train wrecks to that transition cow. Well, again, during this last 10 years or so, 15 years, there's been a lot of research into to blood NEFAs and what physiological effects they have on the animal. And there are, in fact, a lot of reasons why you might say, well, yeah, you could certainly make a case for hating blood NEFA. One of them is that blood NEFAs are felt to perhaps, perhaps uh, causes a, a depression in feed intake. And of course, that would be the last thing we'd want during this transition period. Work from my laboratory said that maybe elevated NEFA actually exacerbates or increases insulin resistance, causing more fat mobilization and sort of a, a vicious cycle. There's data that suggests that maybe it causes a chronic sustained inflammation, which would be detrimental to the animal. Perhaps there's a decrease in immune function. We talk about oxidative stress and trying to minimize that. Well, NEFAs are a major source of, of fuel for causing oxidative stress. Epidemiological studies show that there might be a, a lower chance of pregnancy if NEFA get too high. Work has shown that it, it's likely to cause a decrease in gluconeogenesis by the liver. And we need the liver to make glucose to provide the precursors for lactose for milk milk sugar synthesis. Again, epidemiological studies say, well, we may have greater increase in DA if we have elevated NEFAs. NEFAs can be converted to, by the liver to ketones, such as beta-hydroxybutyrate, which might promote ketosis. And lastly, that NEFA might get deposited in the liver and cause greater liver fat. So it's a long list and it, it's one that could have been lengthened. I'm just showing you 10 here that are very understandable in regards to what implications it may have on the cow. So I, then I came up with a list of why we should love elevated blood NEFA. And in reality, the list is pretty short. Two things, it provides energy for tissues, including the mammary gland. So it provides energy for, for the synthesis of milk. And it also provides precursors for milk fat synthesis. Well, that's obviously a key, key component of the initiation of lactation and milk production. So the list isn't long, but I would argue that it's a high, high quality list, two that are very important. So again, you can you can see the controversy here with what may occur with elevated blood NEFA. So do we always want to do we always want to minimize insulin resistance? Well, nutritionists have been working on this for some time, and and during the last decade so or, or plus, we've we've implemented a, a dietary regime on many farms called the controlled energy diet or commonly the Goldilocks diet. And basically that what this is, is a dry cow diet that's, that's high in low quality forage. It's, it's typically some type of straw, wheat straw, et cetera, but it doesn't have to be. It just has to be some low quality forage to bring down the energy density of the diet. So the idea here is that when the animal consumes this diet at libidum, with that low energy density that, that the animal won't overconsume energy. And that becomes important in the context that historically, it's been very, very common to overfeed dry cows. So this is a strategy that says, well, let's, let's try to implement a dietary regime that just meets the animal's energy requirements. And in fact, there's a, a, a fair amount of research that that shows that, yep, these cows are in fact less insulin resistant. In other words, they're more insulin sensitive. Okay, so being more sensitive to insulin, there's lower rates of lipolysis. Lower rates of lipolysis, less NEF in blood, less fatty liver, and less BHBA or beta hydroxybutyrate. On this slide, I'm, I'm showing a summary of 10 studies. And 
And don't worry about the blue versus the red bars. It's just a little bit different methodology and how they control the energy being fed. But, but each of these experiments had two treatments. One was the controlled energy diet, and one was a diet in which they were overfeeding energy. And they looked at several metabolic parameters as well as lactation. Well, this slide shows, shows the change in NEFA concentration after calving. And I, I, I don't want to get bogged down in all the statistics. Just look at the bars and, and the magnitude of these bars. The, the axis here, the y-axis, is really the percent change. So I think you can, can make a pretty convincing argument that feeding these controlled energy diets does, in fact, reduce NEFA concentration, maybe sometimes up to 20 to 30 percent reduction in, in blood NEFA. This is the blood beta hydroxybutyrate concentration in these studies. And again, overwhelming evidence that these diets will lower blood BHBAs in, in early lactation dairy cows. This is the liver triglyceride. So in each of these experiments, they took liver biopsies to measure the amount of triglyceride or fat in the liver. And perhaps not quite as straightforward, but certainly many situations here in which, which liver fat was, was reduced. But what is rarely talked about when, when these diets are, are, are discussed is, is the following data. Now this is this is the milk production data. And again, it's the same concept. We have a control and a control energy diet, and then another diet that was that was overfeeding energy. And this shows the change in milk production when when the animals were on the controlled energy diet. And you can see the diet's mixed. It, it's really maybe somewhat inconclusive. But again, you can see there were three instances out of the 10 in which there were some pretty large and then the magnitude of eight to, to 11, 12 pounds of reduced milk production postpartum. This, this graph is quite conclusive though, I think, in that it shows that almost universally, universally you'll see a, a decrease in, in milk fat percentage. If we look at milk production on either an energy or fat corrected milk basis, depending on how it was reported in the study, again, somewhat mixed, but yet more often a negative response. And again, sometimes a very large response towards the negative side of, of in that 11 to 12 kilograms of energy or fat corrected milk. So in reality, when we think about this, the data makes total sense. When, when controlled energy diets are fed to try to moderate and reduce insulin resistance, you have less fat mobilization, less NEF in the blood, you have less NEF as an energy source to the mammary gland, less precursor for milk fat synthesis, and therefore you shouldn't really be surprised that there was this downstream effect on lactation performance. So actually, when we talk about managing the transition cow, the goal is to have a balancing effect or balancing act to provide sufficient NEFA to the mammary gland, but yet not over flooding the system to have it be toxic. I wanna show another incidence of, of where insulin resistance is not necessarily a negative thing. And that's, that's really in the, the comparison of high versus average genetic cows. This data is getting somewhat old now, but but it was a classic experiment that was that was done in the 70s and 80s where they they took four university herds and they split them in two. And to half the herd they used average quality semen to perpetuate that half of the herd. And the other the other half of the herd they used very high quality semen the very best that genetics had to offer. So over time, this experiment went on and on. And on this, this graph, you can see that, yep, if we take a look at milk production, those cows that were bred using high quality semen, that half of the herd had much higher milk production than those that were provided the average semen, probably about 
seven or eight kilograms of milk per day, or let's say uh, about 15 pounds. The bottom graph is simply fat corrected milk, and you can see that this difference is right out of the gate. And and the superiority of the the high genetic group. Now let's take a look at what was happening metabolically with these animals. This lower panel on the left is feed intake. And you can see during weeks one and two, and maybe starting to split out a little bit at week three, but during that transition period, there's essentially no difference in feed intake. Over time, the high genetic group does show, show higher feed intake, becoming statistically significant at five weeks. Well, if they're making more milk but not eating more feed, as you'd expect, they're in a more negative energy balance during that postpartum transition period. We come down to this lower graph on the right. The high group has higher NEFA concentration and higher BHBA, suggesting that this may be a metabolic characteristic of our cows with higher genetic potential. This is an experiment that was done in New Zealand. Again, they basically created two different herds of cows, one based on North American Holstein Friesian genetics and the other using localized New Zealand semen for their, their Holstein herd. And you can see that again, there was a difference in these two herds, 68 versus about 75 pounds of milk produced per day. Now, in these animals, they did what's called a glucose tolerance test. They give them a big dose of glucose, and they look at how fast this glucose is cleared from blood, taking a look at insulin responsiveness. And if you take a look at the genetically superior animals, there was a faster fractional turnover rate and a lower glucose, or rather a slower fractional turnover rate and a higher glucose half-life. And basically what these two numbers are saying is that there is greater insulin resistance in the animals that have the higher genetic potential. So lastly, I wanna go into what, is, what does this all mean in the, in the context of, of NEFA and, and BHBA testing? And you can see this is a very simplified diagram of of the physiology of the animal. We have the body fat during the transition period. The NEFAs are mobilized from body fat. They enter into the blood. The liver takes up about a third of those fatty acids released. The liver can do several things with that fat, those fatty acids. It may get stored in the liver. It may be metabolized to beta-hydroxybutyrate. So that's a, a metabolic end fate of NEFA in the liver, beta, beta hydroxybutyrate. We also can get beta hydroxybutyrate from the rumen though, however. Okay, so basically blood NEFA and BHBA are used as indicators of negative energy balance. NEFA perhaps more directly, BHBA perhaps more indirectly because they're a metabolite, plus there's another source of BHBA other than what might be derived from NEFA. But there have been many studies now that have been conducted to take a look at, well, gee, can NEFA get too high? Can it be detrimental to the, to the animal? In other words, can this insulin resistance become a foe if it becomes too extensive? And these studies are, are really quite, quite consistent. And they say that if our postpartum NEFA exceed about 700 micromolar, or if our BHBA get above 1.2 millimoles per liter, that perhaps we may have a reduction in milk and perhaps a, a detrimental effect on, on reproductive performance. I wanna point out that, that these studies, there are many of them, they tend to be very consistent and many of them were done with large, large, large animal numbers across many farms. As a consequence of this enhanced knowledge that we have is that 
we've gotten to a point where routine testing is occurring on farm for, for BHBA. We have these handheld meters. And although a little more complicated, oftentimes NEFA analysis is done, but blood samples have to be sent into laboratories for, for that analysis, so it's a, a little bit more complicated. So we have these, these cutoffs, and typically what people will say, well, if you're 10% or maybe sometimes the cutoff is 15% of your herd is above 1.2 millimoles per liter of BHBA, you've got you've got an issue. We've got a we've got a red flag being raised there. So we we use these in a troubleshooting situation. Well, my question is, does this always work? Let's take a look at a fairly recent study done at the UW Madison where they basically surveyed 570 cows in the herd after calving they sampled cows twice weekly between five days postpartum and 18 days postpartum they tested for bhba and if they were above 1.2 they were called hyperketonemic and about 20 percent of the herd was in fact hyperketonemic so that would be a red flag the cows that were hyperketonemic were treated with 300 mils of propylene glycol as a control measure for three days. Now let's take a look at milk production and you can see the two lines. The square boxes that are open are those cows that were hyperketonemic. The animals that were not are in the solid boxes. And you can see there's a milk production differential of about Again, probably five or so kilograms of milk per day. So we're talking again about 11, 12 pounds of milk per day in advantage of those animals that were hyperketonemic. This is a Dutch study. Again, they surveyed 23 herds. They, they classified the cows that were sampled between seven and 14 days postpartum as either being non-hyperketonemic or, or not clinically or subclinically ketotic. 41% of the cows. 47% of the cows were subclinically ketotic and the rest were at three or above, which sometimes people refer to as clinically ketotic. But let's take a look at milk production. Milk production again was highest for those cows that were hyperketonemic, suggesting that this may be a, a consequence of high milk production. So what really prompted the discussion that I had with this talk at, at Cornell was, was the common, common thing that I was hearing from the field, either phone calls, visits, emails, people saying, hey, I've implemented this this BHBA testing and too many of my cows are testing high, they're above the 10 or 15% cutoff threshold, but yet my cows are milking like crazy. I, they, they've never been producing more milk. Well, wow, if, if this is such a horrible thing, why, why are the cows doing so well? So a couple of concluding comments. I'm not against BHBA testing. I'm I'm in favor of BHBA testing. In fact, I I think it helps monitor the metabolic status of cows and herds, and I think it it monitors changes over time, and I think it can be indicative of when trouble may be brewing if these levels come up. What I am a little bit concerned about is using cutoffs the 700 for NEFA or the 1.2 for BHBA. I think interpreting these blood tests has to be much more complicated than that. My biggest concern is I don't think these one size cutoff fits all herds. We saw with the genetic herds at these universities, the average versus the high genetic potential cows, that the high genetic potential cows will have higher NEFA. So the question I would ask is should be, should we be more lenient with those cows in, in when we raise that red flag? 
Is there a, a different cutoff that should be used in these high quality, these high genetic herds? And so like many things in life, we just make things too simple when really they are not that simple. So I tell people, you know, if you've got high NEFAs and high DHBAs and you, your cows are milking well and there's no other issues, no problems with health that are, are outstanding, no issues with poor reproductive performance, we're getting our cows bred back, well, be happy, relax. I wanna conclude with this slide and, and, and some of you that may have heard me present before know that this is probably my favorite slide in my slide set, but I, I think it's most apropos for, for this talk today. And basically this is a quote from a, a presentation that was later published in a book. It was by Dr. John Newbold. The title of the talk or the chapter that later was published was Liver Function in Dairy Cows published in Recent Advances in Animal Nutrition. And in this book, he states, nutritional restriction to adipose tissue mobilization may be necessary. In other words, he's saying, trying to do something to control fat mobilization might be necessary, whether it be a controlled energy diet or, or propylene glycol or several other agents that we have at our disposal. But Newbold said there's a philosophical problem we have selected cows that have increased reliance on mobilized body reserves as a source of nutrients for milk production. We saw that with the average and high genetic cows. We selected cows to be this way. The farmer has paid the geneticist for this. Are we now going to ask him to pay his nutritionist to work in the opposite direction to suppress fat mobilization? Newbold says we have our priorities wrong. We should explore what can be done to help the liver deal with mobilized fatty acids before considering whether we wanna take action to try to block lipolysis or block the amount of fatty acid supplied to the liver. So going back to our simple schematic, historically, and I've spent a, a good deal of my career trying to, to look at this approach to controlling NEFA mobilization. And that is to, to try to find means by which we can block fat mobilization. Again, many, many experiments, many, many compounds, a lot of time spent. And really, really what Newbold had was somewhat of a different vision. He was saying, hey, first off, let's, let's not worry about NEFAs. What we should be doing is trying to target the liver and to keep that fat moving out of the liver and not being stored or not being converted to BHBA. And there's, there's only one compound that at least I know of now that's available for doing that. And that is the, the use of choline. You know, choline's a, a compound that's degraded in the rumen, so it has to be rumen protected but that is in fact a compound that helps the liver deal with these NEFAs, helps to get it exported from the liver so that those NEFA can ultimately be delivered to the mammary gland as an energy source and a source for milk fat synthesis. So I'm gonna conclude with this slide, a few questions for you to think about. Are elevated NEFA or BHBA always bad. Does a one size cut off, 700 for NEFA, 1.2, some people use 1.4 for BHBA, as our alarm level always serve us well? Or does it cause us to be perhaps too much of an alarmist, particularly in these high genetic potential herds? What are you gonna tell if your dairy producer or one that you work with has too many cows that are testing high with NEF and BHBA, but, but seem to be doing well, or healthy, getting bred back in a timely fashion? 
how will you manage fat mobilization? Are you going to take the kind of the old approach of, of blocking lipolysis, or are you going to take a more aggressive approach of trying to help the, the, the move the fat out of the liver? And finally, here's one that I think is a, a great question: is how are you going to manage body condition scores on your farm? We've we've seen a, a pendulum change that I think is sort of unprecedented in my lifetime. When I when I came out of graduate school and became an assistant professor, we were recommending that cows should dry off with a body condition score of 3.5. Some were even saying 3.75 in well-managed herds. And over time, that lower became lower and lower and lower to where 3.25 is now commonly used. Occasionally, I'll hear 3.0. A couple of years ago, I was at a conference in Europe where they had a speaker recommend 2.75. My jaw dropped. I thought, my goodness. That's ridiculous, but but the objective in this lower and lower body condition score recommendation is to avoid complications with too much fat being accumulation, too much insulin resistance, too much fat mobilization, and one way to avoid all those issues completely is to simply say, let's not put body fat on that cow. Unfortunately, though, she doesn't have the fuel to perpetuate her, her lactation after calving. So with that, I'd, I'd like to uh, conclude and, and turn it back over to the organizers of the conference. Five cents might not seem like much, but when it's five cents for every cow every day, then it really adds up. New AminoSure XM Precision Release Methionine provides the optimal combination of cost, feed stability, rumen stability, and intestinal release to deliver the best cost per unit of available methionine on the market today. Learn how at balchemanh.com slash findyourx. Dr. Grummer, our first question is, physiologically, how do low energy rations, such as Goldilocks, make cows less insulin resistant? Well, essentially it, it changes the, the metabolic milieu of the cow during this period of time. And, and actually there are quite a few changes that can occur with this, this type of a diet. But, but the one, that is is the most important and the pertinent to this this discussion today is that it can directly affect the adipose tissue and the insulin receptors on the adipose tissue and and how those insulin receptors react to the circulating levels of, of hormone in the blood so it's basically uh, an alteration of the receptor mediated process that goes on in in adipose tissue and and it it goes on in other tissues as well as i mentioned muscle etc while ignoring the 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 insulin tissue or non responsive insulin tissue such as the mammary tissue so it it is a it is a a molecular receptor mediated event in which the, the signal just not, is not conveyed in a complete manner. All right, thank you for that. Um, our next question, what is the reason behind higher genetic animals having higher insulin resistance? And is there a way to improve or lessen the insulin resistance in high genetic cattle? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, I really can't, can't answer that question simply from the standpoint that 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 herd of animals that was developed in these an, in in these universities was disbanded in in the late 1980s um, so to really be able to study that question in a well controlled situation 
you would have you would have needed that type of a setup. And unfortunately, we don't have those animals to to study in depth, in detail, using the the molecular tools we have today to study. So I can't I can't really tell you physiologically why it is that these animals are basically more insulin resistant. Um, it you know it's probably again at a, a a receptor cellular level. It's you know part of evolution. It's part of genetics, uh, gene selection, etc. That is all involved with that. But again, that hasn't been studied. So so the question then is if they are more insulin resistant, how do how do we make them less insulin resistant? In other words, how how could we shut off their fat mobilization or try to 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 minimize that? And again, you'd use the same thing with, with that cow as you'd use in, in any cow, really. And that's, you can use the, the nutritional manipulations that we, we know that we have at our disposal. One we discussed, which was the controlled energy diets. Another example is propylene glycol. Basically, uh, what you are doing with propylene glycol is, is stimulating an insulin response in that animal when you drench a cow with propylene glycol. If you go back to our original diagram on, on insulin responsiveness, as you increase the insulin concentration in the blood, and you can do that by giving propylene glycol, that, that will give you a more, more of an insulin response and dampen that lipolytic response. We know niacin is a compound that can, can minimize that lipolytic response, that's, that's actually been very well studied. Uh, chromium is another compound that has been suggested to alter insulin sensitivity and, and to potentially reduce insulin responsiveness. So there are, there are tools that, that we can use. You know, the question is, do we wanna use them? And I'm not saying that we don't, I'm just saying I agree with Dr. Newbold that I'm not sure that that's our first strategy, that our first strategy is to help the liver and using the, the tool of rumally protected choline is what works there. But if we're still having issues where we're having too high of NEFA mobilization and we are getting into health problems or we are having reproductive problems, then we can bring in the second line of tools to not only help the cow's liver, but to help dampen that, that lipolytic response. Excellent. Uh, here's one that's related to the last one, a little different twist. Is there information about whole lactation or la lifetime milk production in regards to post-calving NEFA and BHBA le levels? Yeah, uh, that's that's a good question. And and in fact, in fact, there is. Um, Many of these studies that have been done that are what I call field trials, field tests, on-farm studies, where they have gone out and measured either BHBA, usually once in a while NEFA, and then study the, the lifetime production level of these animals. It, it is something that would be sustained for the, the entire lactation. So when you, you look at study X, and study X as well, we are going to lose X pounds of milk if we get above a NEFA concentration within this, usually it's a two to three week window after calving or beta hydroxybutyrate concentration. Usually that that is something that is, is sustained. So it's it's serious. I, I don't wanna trivialize the fact that that we can't get into situations in which which NEFA become too high or BHBA become too high, and there's a carryover effect for the entire lactation. The only thing that I'm saying is that I my issue comes with the interpretation of, of these tests and whether these these strict cutoffs that are implemented are really appropriate for all herds, and and that's where I have a concern. You know, it, it's really no different with BHBA than it is many of the blood metabolites we look at. 
or for example, liver enzymes. For years, we assessed liver health by looking at liver enzymes that leak out into the bloodstream and, and we try to come up with a number, too high or too low. This is your number. And I understand this, I, you know, I mean, that's human nature. We, we have it, the tool, we wanna implement it. We don't want it to be complicated. We want it to be simple. Um, our, our veterinary community wants something that isn't mind boggling and they don't wanna have something that's mind boggling for their, their producers or their clients. So we try to simplify things and I'm just, my cautionary note is we, we get too simple. So if, if there's one alarm level that, like I said, is very consistent, I, I think it probably works great for the average cow, for the average herd. But I think we have to be very careful in that we don't jump off cliffs if we get maybe too many cows testing too high. Yeah, great answer, Rick. Uh, next question, how many days in early lactation a cow stays in, in insulin resistance? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. We think, we think it's probably in that, that two to three week neighborhood. Certainly, certainly as the cow's NEFA levels are going down, that's a great indicator that, that insulin resistance is going away. It's, it's gonna be related to energy balance. And as that cow begins to, to consume more feed, that insulin resistance is going to go away. We know that in well-managed herds that these cows will, will typically get back into positive energy balance 40 to 45 days after calving. We think the NEFA levels have come down to a, a pretty manageable level by, by three weeks after calving. Um, so it's really it's really an issue that only pertains to that that very early lactation cow, and I think that's you know that's why our attention is always focused on those first you know couple of weeks. That's why we do our NEFA and BHBA testing then, because it's it's something that occurs right around the time of calving and that the cow metabolically adapts to and and can get herself out of that situation. All right. So our next question comes from a past esteemed lecturer on the Real Science Lecture Series, uh, Dr. Lamps Bumgard. Dr. Bumgard says, uh, nice talk, Rick. Do you think the immune system plays a role in the normal insulin regulation um, at transition? Um, oh, I, I, I think it does. I'm, I'm not going to sit here, Lance, and, and claim to be an expert on that. Um, so I, I'm really going to kind of fumble the ball here a little bit for you, but I'm 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 sure it does because we know of all the vast ramifications the the immune system has on metabolic signaling and and you know through your work that you've done looking at the immune system and how it relates to hormone function and and blood metabolites. Uh, so I I don't think there's any question that that it does. You know, I, I think we get into situations in which these early lactation cows are immune compromised. And I'm, I'm guessing there's probably a pretty good interaction between the immune system and, and, that, and that immune compromising and, and how insulin's playing a role in that. Very well, we're getting close to the top of the hour, but I believe we've got uh, some time for a couple questions. Um, is it just the liver that is the bottleneck of adipose tissue, lipolysis, lipid mo uh, mobilization, uh, and where does the mammary gland come into the conversation? I, I had a little little static at the beginning of that question. Could you read it again, Scott? Sure. Is it just the liver that is the bottleneck of adipose tissue? Uh, ad post tissue lipolysis and fat mobilization and where does the mammary gland come into the conversation? Yeah. Well when NEFA NEFA are mobilized from adipose tissue, they they are available to be used by by many other tissues. As I referred to in the talk, we think about twenty-five to perhaps a third of the NEFA are taken up by the liver, but other tissues such as the mammary gland also take up NEFA. All right, 
So all, all tissues are exposed to this elevated NEFA. And, and as I indicated earlier, these NEFA can have, can have effects on, on many tissues. It, it can affect, we know the immune system and the immune response in this animals and how it affects inflammation. We know it affects, we know it affects reproduction later on by by embryo development. Um, we know it affects oocyte quality. Uh, so we know these NEFAs can affect many, many tissues um, and they can affect them in a, in a negative sort of way if they become too high. So, so in a way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really say look at, at the liver as the only bottleneck in the standpoint that it, it's the only tissue that it causes trouble with. Um, it it can have negative effects on many tissues, but but clearly, but clearly we we have a desire to have NEFA arrive at the mammary gland. That's a good place for it to go. That's a useful place for it to to go. And we know, based on research that we did at the University of Wisconsin, that elevated NEFA does cause a lot of havoc when taken up in excess by the liver, as far as as function of the liver. Gluconeogenesis is affected, ureogenesis is affected, hormone production and responsiveness is affected in the liver. So, so we know it, it's a complicating factor in the liver. We know that it's a complicating factor in many tissues. We know it's it's a good thing. I've never heard of anything necessarily bad about having too many NEFA at the at the mammary gland. But but yeah, it it can be an issue at many places, but but the liver is where it tends to get stored if it becomes excessive. And that's, that's why the liver is correctly a, a, a bottleneck and one of concern. All right, let, uh, Rick, last question uh, comes from north of the border and a big, big shout out to our friends in Canada who've been showing up in large numbers to our webinar series. Thank you for your support. Um, are Goldilocks diets linked to low colostrum volumes from cows, quantity of um, colostrum, and how about um, and how about quality of IgG levels? Um, I know that it is not; it does not affect uh, colostrum quantity. Um, there is, there is, I think some of the work and 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 maybe uh, Scott may pipe in on it. I think, I think there is some evidence that there might there might be some small effect um, on colostrum quantity, but but it's not it's it's not a statistically significant effect. And in and in general, boy, there's a lot of research that says that it's just very difficult to to affect colostrum quality by energy level of the transition diet. Um, it, you know, if you take the overall body of literature, taking a look at energy density or energy intake during the dry, dry period, there's just, there's just not an effect on, on, on colostrum quantity. Likewise, I think I think the immunoglobulin levels are, if you take a look at the the vast majority of research on this, and and I'm going beyond I'm going beyond the Goldilocks studies here because there's been many many studies looking at in the early days we we looked at forage to concentrate ratio, um, and then and then we sort of looked at NDF levels of 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 dry cow diets, and there's a lot of research taking a look at at the effects of NDF and forage to concentrate levels. And boy, that, that colostrum quality is a really, a really tough one to change by altering energy density of the diet. So, so my answer is gonna be that I, I think the effects are, are perhaps minimal if, if, not, if not at all. All right, thank you, Dr. Grummer. This has been a real treat. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. On behalf of Balcam and Dr. Grummer, thank you for joining us today.